Tampa. Okay. Anyone who's interested can just um, look us up. Anyone who is watching the recording and missed our intros, that's okay. Um, okay. As tri oh, um, thank you, Trish. As uh, as Trish said, my name's Allison Bishop. I am a um, I am a CPA. I am a, uh, I have a financial co coaching practice in Portland. Um, so I talk to people about their personal finances. Um, so oh, I need to share my screen. Okay, let me start the presentation. Okay, so we, um, I'm going to start by giving a, a brief overview of financial abuse and also how I see it in my practice. And then um, Allison and Barbara, who are both attorneys, are going to talk about what they see in their practice um, and also, you know, legal recourse and, and what, what people can do, what clients can do, and then what we as financial professionals, what kind of resources we can help out. Um, so financial abuse, that's what I tend to call it, but it's also called economic abuse. Um, so financial abuse happens when an abuser takes control of finances to maintain power in a relationship and possibly to prevent the other person from leaving. The abuser controls the victim's ability to acquire, use, and maintain financial resources. Um, I know I see that a lot in terms of um, people are afraid to leave. If they're in a situation where they've never had access to money, they can't. If, if it's a divorce situation, they can't afford a, a lawyer because, um, and so if at least if they go back to their abuser, you know, they know their children are going to eat. So I see that a lot. There's a lot of fear around leaving a situation. Um, incredibly, financial abuse occurs in 98% of abusive relationships and is the number one reason victims stay in or return to abusive relationships. So it's really prevalent and really powerful. Um, so who can be affected? In my practice, I see it mostly in partner or spousal relationships. Um, Allison has a similar experience and she's going to expand upon that a lot, but it can affect anyone. Barbara's going to address uh, abuse of elderly people by family members or strangers. But other people can be vulnerable as well. So you have very young people, folks who are disabled, and they can have any relationship to their abuser. It can be a friend, a family member, a neighbor. What I have realized over the last, I'm going to say 18 months, is that a lot of times victims of financial abuse have no idea they're being abused. Um, a lot of times it's because the relationship has just sort of organically evolved over time. Um, and so they don't realize it's gotten to a point where it's not healthy and it's also not normal. And because in our society, we don't talk about money, they're not talking to their friends and seeing that it's unusual to have to beg for money to buy your kids snow boots or to have to answer for every transaction um, or not to know what your spouse, even what their salary is. Um, and so a lot of times, unless somebody specifically tells them that that's not a normal situation. Honestly, they have no idea. And because that has kind of come to the forefront of my realization recently, now if I'm talking to someone and I'm starting to see some red flags, I will actually explicitly say um, something like, oh, what you're describing isn't normal or that's, that's not how most people do it. And it can be hard because it might not be an abusive situation. It might just like organically have evolved where one person bears the brunt of the financial decisions and the other person is like, you know, I don't even want to talk about it. Um, so what I'll try to do is if they're willing, open to talking about it, I will try to give them scripts to open up a conversation about money with their spouse and to say, you know, I have questions about our joint accounts or, hey, can I get online access to this? And then seeing what their, the other person's um, responses is really telling. So if their response is, oh, of course, I didn't think you wanted this or you never want to talk about it. So I've just done it all. That's is, I think a good sign that they can kind of get on the same page. Um, and that's not an abusive situation, of course. And then if their response is no, you know, you know what you need to know. I'm already telling you what you need to know. This is how it is. Then that obviously is a bigger red flag and hopefully they can go find resources. Um, so I talk in my practice a lot about how to set up finances within a relationship. Sometimes it's, it's people getting married. Sometimes it's people who are married who are like, hey, we have dating finances and we need married people finances. Like let's change our bank accounts around. Um, and what I found is a lot of people like to have a level of privacy around their money, which is totally understandable. 
Um, so what that often looks like is maybe they have a joint account for household expenses, and then they have separate accounts and separate checking accounts. And those are for their discretionary spending. And they don't have to answer to the other person. So that in that discretionary account, they can save it, they can spend it, it doesn't matter. Um, and that's a normal and healthy relationship because they jointly agree to it. They have hopefully an equal amount of money available to each of them. Um, and then they should have access to the joint account. So there's a difference between privacy and secrecy. When it becomes a red flag is when one person not only knows more about the finances, but also controls the other person's access to the actual money or to the information about it. Um, and information shouldn't be one-sided. So it's perfectly normal and healthy to have one person be in charge of paying the bills and that sort of thing. Um, and that's not necessarily an abusive situation in itself. What's important is the ability to share information and access. So, like, so I always say like, I do all our finances in our, my household. I don't think my husband has online bank account access. I don't actually know. But if he said to me, hey, can I look at the credit card statement? Or like, you know, I need I need access to our bank accounts. I would, the first thing I would be doing is helping him get that access. Um, he's not super interested in it. Okay, so warning signs. Um, and a lot of these are things I have actually seen. So one partner controls all the accounts and won't let the won't allow the other person access to them. One partner gets defensive or angry when asked basic questions by the other one about their joint finances. If the victim's signature is required to file a tax return or get a loan, the abuser doesn't show them all the related documents. They only see the signature page. This might be relevant, I feel like, to folks like in the MECPA um, if you're getting signatures for things like filing tax returns. And then uh, similarly, digitally signing the victim's name without their knowledge or permission. You know, if they have access to the victim's email address and, or email account, they can just log in. I was before we got on this, I was saying I could easily forge my husband's name on all kinds of digital account, um, all, all kinds of digital documents. Um, being asked to sign forms that they know contain fraudulent information. They're sometimes discouraged from working or having their own money, or the abuser controls the victim's paycheck from the moment it's deposited. I had, it was actually a gentleman, and he said to me, Her money is her money, and my money is her money, meaning he didn't like all the money went to the wife's account and she kind of doled it out to him um, however she wanted to. And then it was the same thing with being asked questions. He said, I I want, tried to prepare for this meeting with you. And so I asked my wife some questions, things like how much does she make? Um, and, and he said she got very defensive and wouldn't answer any of my questions. Um, and this whole conversation was really eye-opening for him because it hadn't occurred to him that this relationship they had going on was not a healthy relationship. Um, so one time, sometimes one partner sabotages the other's employment or education. The employer refuses to tell their partner how much they earn or what assets they have. Um, one person's spending is scrutinized and criticized, but doesn't they don't share their own spending habits. So that's very one-sided. Um, and the abuser opens loans in the victim's name without permission or under coercion. So I'm going to pass it along to Allison Thompson, and she's going to talk about how she sees financial abuse within the family law system. Great. Thank you. So um, as Allison and Trish both said, my name is Allison Thompson. I am a family law attorney here in Portland. Um, I do all family law at this point, and that essentially encompasses divorces, um, unmarried parental rights and responsibilities cases. So kind of by necessity, when I see economic abuse coming up, it's going to be in the context of a spousal relationship or an intimate partner relationship. Um, so I'm going to focus my presentation today on, on those particular kinds of situations because that's what I see. So essentially, a lot of times with economic abuse, it will be coupled with other forms, more obvious forms of abuse. And what I mean by obvious is more objective, um, what a third party would be able to see. You know, if somebody walks into my office with a black eye, clearly something's going on. You're going to be questioning what happened, um, what resulted in that. But not always. And economic abuse can be a standalone um, form of abuse. And it can be incredibly difficult to essentially screen for to determine what is normal versus what's what's this power and control dynamic. Um, and it's really important, I think, for everybody as professionals to understand that 
this is a power and control dynamic, and it's oftentimes the most powerful tool that somebody that is perpetuating abuse can use over their victim. And that's because it essentially cuts off any ability for a victim of this to become independent, to leave the situation. I mean, sometimes even to be believed, right? Because it's much harder to prove. It's much harder to sometimes get the resources or get support when you need it because it can be so complex. But the lack of resources, financial resources for a victim impacts them in various ways. And so some of that is obvious no alternative housing. If you don't have financial resources, you can't go find shelter, a very basic need that we all need. Um, Sometimes it's you don't have, you have a family phone plan and there's no unmonitored devices. Uh, That can be really powerful as well, because if you feel, if you as a victim of economic abuse feel that you're being monitored, you're not going to go talk to people. I mean, so much of what we course or so much of how we correspond is online. So you're not going to talk to resources you do have reaching out to an attorney for help or a domestic violence agency that could be discovered by the person that is perpetuating this abuse on you. So that can be really, really harmful. Um, In terms of hiring an ability or legal counsel, if you don't have cash or money to be able to do that, you're as a victim of economic abuse, you're going to feel very stifled in your ability to go seek out support. Um, There's also a limitation of getting information about what what you can do or what what this even is, right? A lot of times, like Allison said, many people that are victims of economic abuse don't even realize that they're in that situation. And so the, the more that you're limited, the more you don't understand kind of what's going on. There's also a lack of financial resources. What I see coming up in my cases is people are terrified of not being able to support their children, their pets. Um, that, That can be really impactful as well. And then also there's a fear of just starting from scratch with nothing. A lot of people feel like, and I'll explain why this is not necessarily an accurate feeling, but they feel like because nothing's in their name, because nothing is, you know, in their control, they truly have nothing. Um, And that can be incredibly scary for anybody kind of figuring out, is this a relationship I need or a dynamic that I need to leave? So I... Essentially, how does this show up before litigation? If I have a client walking into my office for a consultation saying, this is what I think is going on, you know, what are the kind of warning signs that I look for? And it's really important to note that economic abuse is not something that happens overnight. Almost by necessity, it's most people, if they immediately got into a relationship and were told, I'm going to take over all the bank accounts. You need to quit your job. Um, demand The other person is demanding access to everything, but not providing equal access. That's usually a red flag for most people, right? And it's really easy to say, eh, don't think I want to do that. This is usually a slow drip. Economic abuse happens over time and it is undetected for a long period of time usually, but it also, because of that, it also can take a very significant amount of time to recover from uh, somebody that has been the victim of that. So, and kind of, again, like Allison said, when I see this, when I'm screening for this type of abuse, I'm trying to figure out, is this just a, a divvying up of responsibilities within a marriage or a partnership Or is this something more? Um, Is this coupled with something else? Or has this truly been um, somebody using that power and control dynamic over another person to maintain control and power? So I had mentioned previously that it might feel like for somebody that they have nothing. Um, Assets in the state of Maine, when you're going into a divorce proceeding specifically, it doesn't matter whose name assets are in or debts. It's all marital. And so the reason why I said it, oftentimes it feels like uh, somebody that's been suffering economic abuse, why they have nothing is because they don't know that. They don't know that when they go into a divorce proceeding, even if 100% of the assets are in their spouse's name, they still do have a right to some of that. 
But if they don't have access to resources, if they can't speak to an attorney about that, they don't know that. And so I think it's really important that um, that is known amongst professionals, but also that that can be a reason why sometimes it doesn't look like economic abuse either. Like some attorneys are not not really thinking about that because we can be so um, focused on, well, it's marital anyway doesn't necessarily mean that one of the spouses has access to that or even knows that they're going to at some point. So some other, some actually, you know, examples of economic abuse that I've seen um, in my litigation during litigation is major assets. I have a, a case that I'm thinking of with a house that the spouses couldn't afford to purchase themselves. So they had one of the spouse's parents came in and that was supposed to be transferred over into a marital asset. It never was. That was the actual stated purpose that never actually got transferred into the party's names. And so it, it is no longer an asset that can be touched during the divorce litigation because a third party owns it. It's not a marital asset, despite all of the intentions being that it was going to be in marital money being poured into this home. So that can be a way that that comes up. I've seen credit cards taken out um, in a spouse's name without their knowledge or consent. Kind of along with that, I've seen credit card debt being racked up even when there was consent or maybe they were an authorized user. Um, I've seen a lot of cases where there is a significant amount of debt that that was racked up. Um, money oftentimes gets transferred um, that one spouse doesn't have access to, kind of what we've been talking about, or not even disclosing where that money is. Um, there are processes in, in a divorce case specifically, or any family matter or civil case, where you can try to figure out like, where did this money go? But that can take a lot of time and work, sometimes a forensic accounting, right? And so it can it is a definitely a red flag if money starts disappearing. I've had a case where I filed for divorce on behalf of a client and all of a sudden $50,000 just vanished from an account. Uh, that's that's a big concern. Um, forcing one spouse to provide receipts for routine household expenses, um, such as groceries, ju having to justify every single purchase is a, a big red flag. And then getting in trouble. You know, you see, I see in my clients some anxiety about, well, I don't want to spend this money because, you know, I'll be questioned about it. That That's a problem. Um, I've also seen people threaten to evict their partners from a house that they're the only ones on um, or to report vehicles as stolen. Um, and again, the police aren't always, you know, they don't know all of the circumstances. So they're usually looking at who's it titled to, right? That can be very scary because it's a lack of transportation, a lack of housing. So, and then also the last kind of example I'll share that I've seen is, when the spouse that's being abused goes to find their own employment or is trying to find financial resources for themselves, they'll be stonewalled if they go on a job interview or they're essentially, there is disruption in their workplace. If they get the job, all of a sudden the other spouse is showing up and kind of jeopardizing their ability to, to do work. Um, I think those are all just concrete examples of what we see and what we're looking for when we're kind of doing that screening. Um, as part is during the litigation, another way that this kind of comes up is that one party will deny access to documents. They just won't be responsive to a discovery request. And a discovery request is when we are, as attorneys, actually formally requesting per court order to receive documents like tax returns, bank statements. They just won't provide it. You do have a remedy to try to get the court to enforce that, but sometimes people are just very adamantly not providing it. Um, another kind of side is that of that is non-disclosure. They're not saying, well, what is, you know, we see bank accounts that show up in these documents, like money's been transferred there, but they they gave no explanation of what that account was. Again, this can be a very time intensive process to try to track down every single account, but non-disclosure of accounts does happen. I've had plenty of cases where during the litigation, there's a restriction on resources. They're not paying even court-ordered child support, spousal support, which is what most people think of uh, or what most people call alimony. Um, it's spousal support here in Maine. And then also what I've particularly seen, especially since COVID, was they use the legal process 
abusers use the legal process to delay or hinder a victim's ability to change. And what I mean by that is the courts are still backed up. Uh, we still have not caught up. And so oftentimes you're waiting unfortunately, many, many months or many, sometimes even years to get relief from the court. And unfortunately, people that are perpetuating economic abuse know that. And they are essentially just not paying because they know they're not going to be held accountable immediately. And so that can be really scary. Um, it also along with that, like if an attorney stops getting paid, you know, you're essentially asking the attorney to wait to be paid later if there's no relief from the court. So how is all of this been addressed? Um, economic abuse, I would say, is kind of an up and coming. It's something that the courts, the judges are starting to become more familiar with. And kind of as a state, I would say there's more protections that are going into place. So in 2021, uh, Governor Mills signed an act to address the long term impact of economic abuse of a spouse, by a spouse, excuse me. So essentially what this did is that in divorce cases where assets and debts are being split between the parties, there's new language. And so just as a little bit of background here, Maine is not a state where everything is split equally, like half and half. It's not a 50-50 state. We have what's called equitable division here in the state of Maine. And what that means is that the court looks at a number of different factors, which is actually outlined in the law in determining what is an equitable split. Should that be equal or should it be a 60-40 split, 70-30? It can be many different things. What they've done through this act is that the courts essentially now have to consider as part of its equitable analysis, the um, essentially whether or not there has been economic abuse and between the parties. And if so, whether that should be considered in giving the victim spouse a greater portion of the marital estate or spousal support, which again is alimony. So there's actually something codified now that says economic abuse is a factor the court needs to look at when determining what, what spouse is going to get what in this divorce and what kind of ongoing financial resources need to be paid between the parties. I just want to note, the court has always been able to consider economic misconduct, um, which has, I would say, a more limited definition. Economic misconduct is usually behavior during the divorce litigation, um, but not necessarily a longstanding power dynamic between the parties. So this act really allows the court to take a broader view of what are the long-term consequences of this economic abuse on one spouse, as opposed to, oh, they transferred $50,000. We're just going to deal with, you know, that 50,000 that they transferred during this divorce case. It's, it's much different. Um, also, beginning in 2023, so the beginning of this year, I apologize if you can hear my phone in the back, um, there has been specific language added to the protection from abuse statute. And protection from abuse is what most people know as a restraining order. We call it a protection from abuse here in the state of Maine. And they have now made economic abuse something that you can actually get a formal court order to protect yourself against. Um, I will note a protection from abuse order does have specific definitions in terms of who can obtain one. It doesn't just have to be a spouse. It can be a dating or household partner or romantic partner. Um, there's specific people that can seek this out, but it really allows for immediate protection for somebody that's been an, a victim of economic abuse. And the thing that I like about the protection from abuse statute is it's clear and convincing evidence is what the court needs to see in order to grant this order. And that's that's different than, for example, a criminal case. There's no criminal, to my knowledge, there's no criminal penalty for economic abuse in the state of Maine, but at least victims can go and get some protection. So there's a very specific definition of economic abuse in Maine. And so I put that up on the screen there for you. Um, and so that's what the court is looking for when they are determining whether or not there has been economic abuse. And if a court makes a finding of economic abuse, the court can award a no contact order between the parties for up to two years. 
And they also, in the protection abuse case, in order, they can provide for economic support, access to a home, distribution of personal property or pets. They can really remedy some of the more immediate things that a victim may need. Um, they also can order monetary relief to the victim or the plaintiff that brought the case. Um, that includes like loss of earnings or support, reasonable expenses for personal injuries or property damage, transitional living expenses, moving expenses. Um, and it also doesn't mean that a victim cannot seek out other civil remedies as well. So one of the most immediate, this is a much more quick process. So one of the most effective ways to get protection now is going to be through this protection from abuse, especially if there's a non-married couple, right? They may never go through a divorce, but this might be a different way to, to seek some remedy. So lastly, I just want to talk about kind of what can you do to help? Because um, a lot of times when we're talking about family cases, you're going to have an attorney, right? Or that's that's who is going to be taking on a lot of the advocacy. But in your positions, there are things that you can do. So there is a domestic violence helpline or hotline, they call it. And they actually, I was in a training about a month ago, they encourage professionals to call when you have concerns or you're you're wondering, is this economic abuse? What can I do? They are professionals trained specifically in domestic violence, and they want family, other professionals to call to help identify and seek out resources for people that you are concerned about. I would also really encourage you to ensure access to documentation records for both parties. You know, if you have a joint tax return, both parties are your client. And so you want to make sure that if it's requested, that that's freely given, um, because that can be really helpful for somebody that's trying to get themselves out of this situation. Um, also, you want to collaborate, be cooperative with legal counsel. You know, if I'm calling uh, and saying, hey, I have this client, we haven't been able to get these documents, assuming that you're legally allowed to get that out, do so. You know, that can be really helpful as well. And then another thing I would suggest is check court orders if you're preparing tax returns um, before electing like child related tax benefits or deductions. The court is a family court is going to create an order about who gets to claim those. So it's it's OK. I think it's it's fine to say, you know, can I see the order? Can I check in with your attorney about whether or not you're allowed to do this? Because it, it can be really helpful as well to kind of have a, a wall up before somebody just kind of unilaterally goes and, and chooses to do that. So I believe that's it. And I will turn that over to Barbara. Okay, thank you. So my name is Barbara Splishman. I am an estate planning attorney um, and I also do a lot in the world of elder law and special needs planning. So, I find this really interesting because of the two populations we're talking about. And interestingly, um, a lot of the same human dynamics come into play that make people vulnerable to financial abuse. So, you know, I'll just kind of state the obvious that we've all heard for years that perpetrators are often people close to the victim. And it's just, you know, confirming, you know, Muskie School did a study a few years ago and they came up with varying numbers that 57 to 68% of the perpetrators are family, and the next are good friends, and the next are caregivers. So don't rule anyone out, I think is the takeaway from there. And then of course, across my desk and phone calls, um, there are also cases where people are on phones and there are the stranger financial perpetrators as well. But predominantly, it's going to be people who are close to the individual. Um, and the common the common threads among the people who are who are um, falling prey to this, you know, I just kind of wrote these down as I listened to both both Allison and Allison. It's when people are afraid to leave. That's true for younger people in vulnerable relationships. But when you're dealing with older people. They have that same dependency. And that that um, fear to leave comes across as people really don't want to lose their independence. So they, if somebody is helping them continue to live in their home, they are going to be very cooperative with what that person wants. 
that person needs a little extra cash, if that person wants to live their rent free, what, however it's taking shape, they, they're going to be uh, very reluctant to push back for fear of no longer continuing to live in the home. And the other, um, the other way that it, they're also, they have shame because it is a slow drip. Um, the financial abuse can be going on for a while. And when it finally starts to take shape and somebody realizes what's happening, they're embarrassed. They're embarrassed that they fell prey to it. So there's a lot of shame. And then because it's often family perpetrators, there is a significant amount of wanting to protect the family. So for all of these reasons, it's really important that we professionals who have these very close working relationships with people, that if we see red flags, we do something about them. Um, one other little point I want to make in, in my world where people are developing forms of dementia, you can start to have this gray area. So you may have clients who are paranoid and who are accusing family members of being bad actors. And I guess I would say, don't automatically discount those accusations. You know, things should be looked at. And if people are offended that questions are being asked, just point out, this is a protection to you as well. As long as these accusations are being made, you know, we need to make sure that you're protected and nobody can come back and say that you were doing something wrong. Um, so ways that people take the money. Uh, they go to the bank with the person and they withdraw the money from the bank. Very basic. It's already been mentioned, people apply for credit. I am astonished at how often I see adult children applying for loans in the names of their parents, and their parents do not even know these loans are out there. So it's loans. Um, they take cash. They know where maybe the elder has cash hidden in the house. They live rent-free and refuse to move out um, against the person's will. And adding names to joint bank accounts, this is where we who work in the financial world, if we see joint bank accounts, I always ask, what is the purpose of this? What's the motivation? Because, um, and people, typically it's a matter of convenience, right? People want the adult child to be able to pay bills or access money or have money available when they die, things like that. They're looking to make things easy. I, I explained to them that they could get the same um, outcome by using financial power of attorney. You don't have to have somebody as a joint owner on the account. They can manage and write checks and do things as power of attorney. So I think that's an important uh, point to make to people because something people often don't realize when they say they've got a few children, two or three children, and one child on the bank account, they die. Suddenly that one child is the owner of the bank account. Now, they will typically say, oh, they'll do the right thing and they'll share it with their brothers and sisters. Um, maybe yes, maybe no. But if it's no, there's really no recourse for those siblings. So joint bank accounts, I think, are something that are worth a conversation. And then another, um, you know, refusal to give information. In my world, that, that arises, say if somebody's needing to apply for main care nursing home benefits, we have spouses who refuse to give information. They somehow get it in their head that they're going to basically abandon their spouse and the state will take care of them. They don't have to provide their information because they're scared of losing everything. They want, they're trying to cling to what they have. But, um, but that, that's abusive. Like that's abusive because they've got their spouse set up to never qualify. Well, not to say never, but to make it very hard to qualify for main care because they're failing to provide the information that is needed. Um, what, I'm going to talk about warning signs, but before I do that, a very pragmatic conversation is if you are the professional, you see these red flags and the person is your client, right? Somebody's your client. In my case, you're working with the elder. You've done their taxes for years. You're starting to notice changes. You're starting to see suspicious activity. Who can you tell? right? Because I'm not exactly sure what the ethics rules are for accountants, but I am thinking that they're very similar to attorneys, that you've got this, this 
um, professional client relationship. And you can't just go out and talk to anybody about their finances. Like, hey, I'm concerned there's financial abuse. So what I would suggest is maybe think about within your office, having some kind of protection in place in the form of ask the person to provide a copy of their financial power of attorney, and you can have that on file. So if you do start to see problems, you know who their, their named financial power of attorney is, and you can contact that person. Another practice, I know a lot of financial advisors they have um, a form called trusted person. It's kind of like, fine. it doesn't give the person any decision-making authority, but they are just proactive to say, hey, if something happens, an accident or whatever, who is your trusted person? Who do I have permission to contact? So I think that would be a really um, powerful piece of planning to start building into your intake. Who's the trusted person? Who can we contact if we start to see a problem? Now, in the world of financial abuse, if they're naming the suspected perpetrator, that gets a little dicier, right? So maybe have two people. And then the, the successor person would have the same legal rights as the first person who's named. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk, I, I'll be talking about conservatorship in just a moment, but that's another person who you can communicate with freely. Okay. Warning signs if somebody has an unemployed person living in their house. It sounds very obvious, but when I've seen people starting to take advantage financially, it doesn't start out intentionally, I don't think. I think it's maybe it's a, a, an adult child who they've lost their job, they're having trouble starting to pay their, they need new tires, they're having trouble paying their gas bill, and it just starts to become a little too easy to use their parents' money. And that can begin to snowball. And that begins to be rationalized in the idea that, well, they would want to pay for this. They would want me to have good tires on my car. They would want my child to go to this school, things like that. So it's just sort of hand in the cookie jar that it progresses. So if you come across that there again, I think it's worth a conversation. Like, how does this work in the relationship? Do you all talk about these expenditures? Um, do you know? You know, first off, if it's the elder, are you comfortable with that? Or if you're working with their child, you know, the same thing. Are you having these conversations? Do the siblings know about that? Is there a potential problem on the, you know, down the road when um, when all of this comes out? Okay. Uh, let's see. Substance abuse. That's a huge one. Substance abuse and mental illness. If you've got clients who have a family member with substance abuse and mental illness, they may even be embarrassed to tell you how much money they're giving that person and how long they've been giving that person money. Um, it's often sort of a little secret between the parent and the child who has this issue. And it's a secret from other kids or a spouse even. So that, um, that person who is the uh, abuser in abusing their own body, but also the abuser in the sense they're becoming dependent on this cash flow. So pay close attention to when there is uh, substance abuse or mental health in the family. And frankly, it could even, if you're, I don't know how in depth you like to get with new clients, but again, it's a legitimate question to say, are there things I need to be aware of in the family? You know, do you have any kids with substance abuse? Do you have children with mental health? Because people who have kids with bipolar, that's a big part of their lives. So that's good, good information to have. Another warning sign, caregivers who have a special bond with the person they're taking care of. I'm, I, I just highly, highly suspicious of that. You know, you have a caregiver bringing them to the meeting. You have a caregiver saying, oh, we just had such a good time together. Sometimes I just come over and hang out and we have a cigarette or, you know, it's like, really? Like, this is your new best friend? So pay attention. Caregivers, uh, they are repeat offenders. And then, and then, of course, 
a child who is trying to isolate the parent. So again, it might be a child bringing the parent to meetings, or it might be a child trying to come to meetings on behalf of their parent or a caregiver or somebody, but in, any, any signs of isolation. And that's where I think the point's been made a couple of times, and it's a great point. With electronic signatures, we, in my world, we still have to have wet signatures for state planning documents. But I will have people want to come to meetings and tell me how to draft the power of attorney or how to draft the will. And I don't do that. Even if the person is unable to make it into the, the um, office for physical reasons, I want to at least minimally talk to them on the phone. Typically, if they're within reasonable driving distance, I will just go and meet that person at least one time. I think eyes on is very important. And for preparing taxes, if you're doing it under financial power of attorney, I just think it's a good idea. Have a Tell the person, yes, I'm going to honor your power of attorney, but for my own due diligence, I need to have at least one conversation with your parent. It's just a good practice. All right. Mm -hmm. another, one other factor I'd point out is loneliness. Loneliness is another huge reason people fall prey. And that's one of the reasons people fall prey to the telephone scam. Because scammers call them, scammers talk to them, scammers befriend them, scammers want to learn all about their lives and their children and their favorite color and, and their mother's maiden name. You know, they, uh, they, they become their friend and people are lonely and they, they um, become willing to do things for these people who are regularly calling them because they think we are developing a legitimate relationship. This person calls me a lot more than my no good children, right? So um, so loneliness, if somebody, you know, you've got somebody who just loves to talk on the phone because they spend a lot of time alone. Pay attention to who have you been talking to in the past six months. Okay, options to protect. Here's where, this is really the good, um, where you can really step in and, and help make a difference because it's very common you will get phone calls people say we think this is happening or my sister is doing such and such but what can we do and this is kind of your tool chest to let them know they've got some options number one a financial power of attorney document this is my soapbox it's i think it's the most important document for anybody to have um, and it's very important that they appoint somebody who they trust implicitly. If we've got a new ch new adult child in the picture driving the parent to change the power of attorney, you know, for no apparent reason, that's suspicious. But it is very important to have this power of attorney document because people can do protections with that. They can uh, monitor bank accounts. They can monitor investments. They can even limit how much money is in an account. Um, so for example, make the, make the person less vulnerable. So financial power of attorney is a great tool for protecting. It gets a little dicey when somebody is in that gray area where they're just starting to lose some capacity, but they still check their bank accounts, they still look at their investment accounts, and they could see if money's being moved around by their agent as power of attorney. What the law says is that you have, somebody has the, can certainly revoke their power of attorney at any time, so long as they have the capacity to do so. So if you think somebody's starting to lose that capacity, the fact that they say like, oh, so-and-so is no longer my power of attorney, don't just assume that that is always the case. If they really don't have the capacity to understand the implications of what they're doing, it's it's an invalid revocation. All right. Another important step that, that you all could take is a report to Adult Protective Services. Um, what that does, it requires that an investigation is done. So it, it's a pretty significant step. But they do have to make phone calls. They have to investigate any complaint that comes their way. And if there's nothing there, then they close the file. End of story. Um, I have personally been investigated. Um, not that I did anything wrong, 
But I'm just saying you work with people and their finances, you know, your name's going to get tossed out there sometimes. So Adult Protective Services is a good resource. Another big advantage to that is it starts to create a paper trail of suspected abuse. So it may not be clear exactly what's going on, but there's some suspicion. So it creates a file and, it, and maybe that first investigation will go nowhere, but it begins to snowball. Um, then the police can also be reported. Most often police have to say this is a family matter. Adult protective services can go further than that. They, they can call family members, they can really call anybody. And, um, and then it's on there, it's the record. And then if the second call comes in a year or so later, it just adds credibility to the suspicion. Um, so then conservatorship guardianship. I just wanna talk about this a little bit because often I have potential clients call me and they say, oh, I'm being told to get guardianship for my parent. The first thing is if somebody, if the parent has done their estate planning and there's a financial power of attorney document in place and there are good actors on that document, there's probably not a need for a conservatorship. Guardianship becomes necessary typically if somebody's unsafe in the home. The difference is, and many of you probably already know this, but I'm just gonna go through it. Guardianship is what protects the physical body. So if somebody has really minimal assets, no home, no real estate, guardianship could also take care of finances. But if anybody owns a home or has any investments, then you need two, two appointments. You need guardianship for the physical body, but conservatorship is how assets are managed and protected. And so let's say you've got an adult child who has become a bad actor and their name's power of attorney even, conservatorship would be the avenue to go to probate court, have that revoked, and have somebody else appointed as the conservator who can then manage the assets and, um, and monitor what's going on. Okay, and then the final thing I just wanted to go through was Improvident Transfer Act. This, you, you all may have heard of it, but I'm gonna go into it just a tiny bit deeper. Improvident Transfer Act, just like the, um, the protection from abuse law that Allison discussed. This is one specifically for people who are over the age of 60. And I have bad news for some people. If you're over the age of 60 in terms of improvident transfer, you are legally an elderly person. So here we go. Uh, so this applies to anyone over the age of 60. It's uh, It says any transfer of real estate or a major transfer of personal property and major transfer is any value of 10% of their net worth or more. So if it's a gift of 10% or more or a transfer for less than fair market value to um, from somebody who's over 60 to somebody who they're in a confidential relationship with, then there is a presumption that there has been undue influence unless the 60 year old had independent counsel advise them on that transfer. So if there was no independent counsel, then somebody can come back and say, there's presumed undue influence. If the, the donee, the person who received the gift, can't come back and rebut that presumption that there was not undue influence, and the best way to do that is independent counsel, if they can't rebut that presumption, then the transfer can be voided. So if, if you've got clients who are making significant um, cash gifts, stock gifts, real estate, if that person making the gift does not have their own attorney, then the person receiving the gift is vulnerable. And I point this out because sometimes gifts are made with the best intentions, everybody's on board, it's the right thing. And then the adult kids will say, oh no, well, we're just using my attorney, it's fine. No, it's not fine. And what you're doing, you're putting yourself at risk that that transfer can be challenged. So just let them know, do it right, protect all the parties, have the person making the gift get independent counsel on whether that gift is appropriate or not. Um, and, you know, this applies to when they say confidential or fiduciary relationships, 
it's things like a family relationship, somebody who is a fiduciary, like a trustee, a power of attorney, a conservator, or it's also people medically connected, physician, nurse, healthcare providers, or psychologist, social worker, attorneys, um, spiritual relationship, priest, minister, rabbi, spiritual advisor, friends or neighbors are specifically listed, or anybody who provides care, whether that's paid or unpaid care. So it's basically if anybody has a close relationship or there's some, they're reliable on this person, then in that case, there has to be independent counsel before a transfer is made. And I am going to stop there. And I'm happy at the end, we've got questions. So I'll be happy to answer questions. Yeah, we just have a couple more slides, um, kind of some more resources. Um, and then once we're done, I can't figure out how to put things in the chat while I'm also sharing my screen, but we'll share um, a, a graphic of all, with all the contact info for all the domestic violence organizations in for each of the counties in Maine. And it feels weird. I know we've already talked about the connection, but I, I do think it feels weird to have domestic violence organizations as the resource. Um, but there's there's a few things that are specific to financial like getting your financial life back in order. Um, but really that is the, that's the resource um, for if you're looking at economic abuse. So steps to take if, you know, if you're, if you're advising someone who's leaving a relationship um, where they, there was financial abuse, the first thing I would do is check the credit report. Um, I meant to put the website, which of course is annualcreditreport.com. If you'll recall, we used to be able to um, check that annually for free. And then in, during COVID, they made it weekly. And that recently was made permanent, meaning from now on, you can check your credit weekly on annualcreditreport.com. Um, but gathering information, Allison Thompson touched on this. So gathering up bank statements, investment statements, um, taking pictures of like, if there's statements laying around your house, and even what you may use it, you may not, but at least starting to get information can sometimes even just make people feel better. Um, setting up bank, bank accounts without the other person's name on them. Like I've even had clients who go to a different bank because they're convinced that their former spouse can charm their way into their bank account. So they go to a bank where they don't have a relation. Neither one of them has a relationship with this new bank. Um, changing, of course, passwords to accounts the other person had access to, but also setting up things, security features like two-factor authentication. That's a great security feature um, if you think the other person might be able to access um, of course, removing them from credit cards or joint accounts. I mean, ideally, you'd set up new accounts without them on it, but um, just removing them if, if for whatever reason, that's not an option. Uh, setting up fraud alerts or freezing your credit um, is always, it's it's not that hard to do and it's really effective. Um, and then if you do need to, my credit's frozen. And if I need access, if I need somebody, somebody else needs access to it, I, I just go in and I say, thaw this for three days. And then that's what they call it, a thaw. And then the, it'll refreeze again after however many days I tell them to unfreeze it for. Um, and then I have had clients who are probably legitimately concerned that their devices are being tracked and also um, they're, uh, you know, so looking for monitoring software or potentially getting a new device. Um, I know Allison touched on that when she was talking about cell phones. Um, okay, so specifically for taxes, there's innocent spouse relief. Um, in so I got some wording from the from publication 971, uh, and they talk. The wording is speaking to the taxpayer. So what they say is the innocent spouse relief can relieve you from paying additional taxes if your spouse understated taxes due on your joint tax return and you didn't know about the errors. Innocent spouse, innocent spouse relief is only for taxes due on your spouse's income from employment or self-employment, meaning you can't get innocent spouse relief if it's on your own um, earnings. You can request innocent spouse relief if you filed a joint return with your spouse, your taxes were understated due to errors on your return, and you didn't know about the errors. However, there's an exception. You may be eligible for relief even if you knew about the errors, if you were the victim of spousal abuse or domestic violence before signing the return, you didn't challenge the items on the return because of fear and you signed the joint return because you for, you were pressured or threatened. So you have to request innocent spouse relief within two years of receiving an IRS notice of an audit or taxes due because of an error on your tax return. And then there's actually two other um, forms of relief. One is called equitable relief and one is uh, separation of liability. And that's just where the IRS separates out 
the tax liability for each person. So it's no longer joint and several liability. It's now you are responsible for this, these items on the tax return and your um and the other person is responsible for the other. So according to the IRS form 8857, it covers all three. It covers innocent spouse relief, equitable relief, and separation of liability. And the client doesn't have to figure out what type of relief fits their situation. They file form 8857 and then the IRS considers all the information and then they apply the type of relief, if any, that the client is eligible for. Um, then there's just a few more. I know we're getting really close to the end of time, so I'm going fast. Uh, the earned income tax credit you used to not be able to claim it if you were married filing separately. And now you can, starting in two, uh, 2021, so it's pretty recent, if they lived apart from their spouse for the last six months of the calendar year, they can um, get the earned income tax credit. Uh, and then the SECURE Act 2.0, Section 314, this is a provision where a plan can elect a plan when I, I uh, an employer retirement plan. So a 401k or a 403b, they can elect to have a provision that allows um, individuals to, to withdraw the lesser of $10,000 or 50% of their vested account balance. Um, if you are, uh, if the, if the participant is a victim of domestic abuse. So the distribution you pay taxes, they pay taxes on it, but it's not subject to the early, um, withdrawal penalty, the 10% penalty. Um, so the rules are the distribution must be taken within 12 months of the domestic abuse incident. And then if a plan does have this provision, they can allow for the participant to self-certify that this incident of domestic abuse actually occurred. Then if they do take it out and they want to repay it, they can repay it over the next three years. And then they would get a refund for the income taxes that they paid on it. Um, so this is brand new. And starting in 2024, plans can elect to include a provision for this. So I think it's a great idea because uh, as we talked about before, there's a lot of times that the victims of financial abuse, abuse have no access to money and they don't know what to do. So allowing them to withdraw some money from their retirement plan um, is a good uh, step. Then there's the National Network to End Domestic Violence. They have a credit building program. Um, so this is obviously for someone who's either their credit got trashed or they were never allowed to build credit. So they have the credit of like a teenager because their spouse did all the loans in their own name and didn't ever have them as authorized users. So they don't have credit. So it's called the Independence Project. A survivor can apply for a credit building micro loan of $100 and they repay this loan over the subsequent 10 months with no interest. So if they, if they get the best possible credit score improvements, if they repay it consistently on a monthly basis until it matures, and then NNEDV tracks the repayment um, and they undertake the reporting to the three credit bureaus. So it's a, an effective way to help people start to rebuild their credit. And then finding our voices, um, is a, it's a, an additional nonprofit for domestic abuse um, survivors. So I'm going to stop sharing and then I will prom I promise to hand out that I will attach in the chat. Um, oh, I forgot. I, I, I had our contact information on another, another slide and it's no longer up there. <laughs> I can, I'd be happy if it's okay with all of you that I can share the slides. If you send it to me along with the resources, I yes. can send that to all of the um, participants I will be in the registrants. Yes. I'll so send I will you be the happy slide. to do that. I'm right now. So if anyone has questions, I'm right now trying to figure out how to attach something in the chat. Oh, I can't do it. I'll be happy to send it out. Okay. I'll, I'll send you both, Trish. I'll send the slides and then this um, attachment that, that I thought you could. <laughs> but if anyone has questions, I know we're, people probably need to get going, but um, well, in the chat, people are absolutely requesting the slides and saying great information. And is any before we do sign off, and I recognize and thank our presenters because I failed to do that at the beginning while we were recording. Um, does anyone have any questions? I would say the group's small enough to just speak out or Hi. speak up. My name's Hannah Tackett, and first of all, thanks everyone who um, all the panelists super helpful information. Um, we've seen an uptick in romance scams with elder clients. We've had three different clients over the last year or two, um, you know, have these people enter their lives either over the internet or even in person that are just super helpful individuals that, um, 
you see an uptick in requests for distributions. Um, so that was one that uh, I work at a financial advising firm um, that before entering this field, I never would have even considered that that's a potential victim of, you know, a lonely older single person. Uh, so I just wanted to add that um, as something that we're seeing a lot. And then the gray area, we have a lot of clients who will have powers of attorney on file for when something happens. And then we're put in a position where we have to evaluate, has an event occurred that triggers us to utilize the power of attorney right. now? So we've been doing a trusted contact um, on file, just saying in the event that we have concerns, who should we reach out to? And that bridges the gap where we say, you know, we're not attorneys. We can't dig through a POA and say, this is definitely a, a circumstance where a POA needs to go into effect. Um, so that's been a yeah. tool we use as well. Okay. That's helpful to know. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. There's something in the chat. That was Cliff. Um, we cannot do that. Okay. Cliff, you can jump on, but I'm reading it. There is a problem with sharing a client's info with an attorney. We cannot do that unless the client or both clients in the case of marriage filing joint signs a form 7216 allowing us to share that information. That's good to know, too. I'm going to have to look up Form 7216 now. <laughs> I'm writing too. it down. <laughs> so in that situation, Allison Thompson, you commented about collaborating. Can you address that at all? Yeah, so I would probably make that known if if it is something that you feel like, oh, I, I'm not ethically going to be able to provide this because the attorney that's working with the client, the mutual client can probably get a court order, which I assume you'd probably need to comply with. Um, and Or there may be ways that we can require both parties to give permission if it's being revoked or, or withheld. Um, so in the context of family law litigation, we as family law practitioners, we may be able to kind of assist in getting you what you need to be able to follow your rules of ethics in order to give us what we need. Thank you. Any other questions before we wrap up? Well, seeing none, thank you so much, Allison Thompson of Thompson Law, LLC, Barbara Schlich Schlichman, I apologize for butchering yeah, your name for the first time, of Perkins Thompson. Um, and Allison Bishop of Allison Bishop Financial Coaching, we thoroughly enjoyed this presentation and are so thankful that you shared your vast knowledge on this topic. Um, so thank you very much. I will share the slides. And if anyone has questions, I think Allison Bishop, you mentioned that your contact is in there. If anyone has yeah. follow up questions, are each of you OK with them reaching out? They identify themselves as having been a participant on this program. So yeah, that's fine. Fine. Yeah, well, the last you. slide is, um, I was just going to say, has the, our, I just put our email addresses. I figured that was the prefer, preferred That's fine. method. Thank of you very much. Thank you for all the attendees. Um, and thank you to our presenters. It was great. And I hope everyone has a great afternoon. Great. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. <laughs>